included in the very uh, on a list of uh, speakers. Um, so I'll be talking to you about some of the work we do in my laboratory at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, our center in Bangalore is called the National Center for Biological Sciences, and we are part of the Tata Institute, which is based mainly in Mumbai. Uh, so before I, uh, you know, students always like to sit at the back of a hall, uh, not just here, but in any lecture hall anywhere in the world. Uh, one problem about sitting right at the back is that you might not be able to see the slides properly. So if uh, uh, it might be useful to move a few seats in front. Um, uh, no, no, no. If you get bored and you want to go out, you can feel free to go out. No, no, I don't do that. Um, but uh, so let me begin by no, unless you have super sharp eyes, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, what I would presume that the audience is a general audience with uh, some undergraduate or training in science or at least exposure to science. Uh, if you do not understand or want me to clarify any point, please uh, raise your hands or just interrupt me anytime you want. Uh, what I will be talking to you is talking to you about proteins. Uh, proteins are the workhorses, they are the uh, they are the objects which do all the work in your bodies, in your cells. So whether it is maintaining, transporting things from one part of the cell to another part of the cell, or transmitting uh, nervous impulses from your brain to your spinal cord, or mounting an immune, re uh, uh, immune response when you have an infection, all that work is done by proteins. And what I'll be talking to you today is about how proteins get the shape which allow them to function. Proteins are polymer chains. You all know about chemical polymers, polyethylene, polyacrylic acid, polyacrylate, etc. These are all chemical polymers which, if you take the polymer chain and look at it in solution, it will be like a necklace. You know, if you take a necklace, it will flip, flop, uh, it won't have any particular shape. But a protein chain, which is a polymer also, unlike a chemical polymer or unlike a necklace uh, which you might wear, has a very well-defined shape. Every atom in the protein is positioned with an accuracy of 0.1 angstrom. So, and it is because of this very precise shape that proteins have the function which they have. Okay? So if they are a receptor in your nervous system, they are able to function as a receptor because they have this very precise shape. If it's an enzyme, they are able to function because of this very precise shape. And the field of protein folding, which is the field I work in, is concerns itself with how does this chain, which is synthesized as a linear chain, how does it fold into this very precise structure. All the information for the folding is contained in the sequence of the chain. You know, a protein, any polymer is made out of monomeric units. If you have uh, polyethylene, uh, it's made of ethylene units joined to one another in a long chain. A protein chain is different from many organic chains. It's that it is a heteropolymer. Instead of having only one type of monomeric unit, it has 20 types of monomeric units. So the way to think about it is that you have a necklace of beads of not just one color, but of, of beads of 20 different colors. And it's because of the chemical and physical interactions between these beads of 20 different colors that the protein is able to fold into a very precise shape. Okay? So if you take an ordinary necklace of 20 different colors and 
you put the beads in whatever order you want, it will never fold. It will just flip flop around. If you take a protein chain of beads of 20 different colors, so these beads for a protein are called amino acids. Uh, the chemistry of each amino acid is different from another amino acid. These beads will, in a, if you just do it randomly, it will not fold. But because of evolution, over millions of years, you have sequences of amino acids, so sequences of these colors which have been selected, which can fold to very precise structure, and hence give function to the polymer chain, which has folded into the protein. And many of you would have seen So many of you would have seen pictures of proteins uh, shown a particular function. So proteins, as I said, are polymers of beads of 20 different colors. And this is a machine inside your cell. Uh, in, uh, Professor Ramkrishna, Venki Ramkrishna, a few years ago, who got the Nobel Prize for solving the structure of this uh, ribosome. This is the bead of uh, necklace of uh, beads of 20 different colors which is coming off the ribosome. And as it's coming off, as you can see, it's coming off out here, it starts folding. By folding, I mean it starts bending, looping, twisting, etc. till it forms the structure. So the protein folding problem, which is a problem which is there in science uh, for many, many years now, 30, 40 years, is how does this necklace of beads of 20 different colors here you see only one color, but if those of you are close by can see that there are different letters, so you may find different amino acid residues in each of these circles. How does this necklace fold into a structure such as this? With each atom, and there may be thousands of atoms in a protein, precisely positioned with it plus minus 0.1 of an angstrom. If it becomes plus minus 0.2, the protein may lose its function. So this protein has a particular function because of the sequence of letters in the necklace. And as I said, it is structure which confers function to any protein. So you all know that there are proteins which chew up other proteins, which eat up other proteins. These are called proteases. And your digestive system has got many of these proteases because if you eat food, that food has to be broken up all the proteins in your food have to be broken up by enzymes which are present in your stomach, which are present in your intestine. One such enzyme, very important enzyme in your intestine is chymotrypsin. So chymotrypsin is able to break other proteins because three parts of the chain which are shown out here are positioned very, very precisely with respect to each other within plus minus 0.1 of an angstrom. This protein, which is also a protein which breaks up uh, other proteins, has the same three chemical parts positioned exactly the same way. So you can see that these three parts and these three parts are positioned the same way, but the scaffold which brings the parts together are completely different. Okay. You can see that the structures look completely different and they are completely different. Okay. So the scaffold is the rest of the protein. It's a big thing. The role of all the big things is to bring these three amino acid residues positioned exactly in a particular way so that this protein and this protein can chew up other proteins. This protein is a bacterial protein, but commercially it is very, very important because you might have seen uh, advertisements on the newspapers, on TV, about uh, laundry detergents which have enzymes inside them. Okay. So the idea is that many of the stains you get on your clothes are stains caused by proteins in food or proteins uh, which are staying in your food. So the, how do you clean your clothes? And you put an enzyme which will break up in your detergent, which will break up the uh, protein stain in your clothes. And the first successful biotechnology company, Genentech, they made the money and still make nearly most of the money by taking this protein from bacteria and engineering it so that it would work under conditions where you wash your clothes. So hot water 
and sophic conditions, IPH conditions. And this is the enzyme that in brute force they change the color of each of the sequence of amino acids in this protein so it will work in your laundry detergent. So this uh, laundry detergent for Thai has, for example, it's marketed in India as this enzyme inside it. And many other detergents also have it. But the protein chain is big, um, under, over 200 residues in this. Only three are important for breaking up other. Uh, other uh, proteins and the function of this whole is to act like a scaffold to bring these three things together so that they can do the job and so the fold of the protein is very very important okay. so the protein folding problem is how do you go from the protein sequence to the protein structure and I think Professor Balram uh, a couple of days ago might have talked a little about how you go from genome to protein uh, structure. So this is the problem. How do you go from an unfolded protein to a folded protein? And this is a problem which has been there for several decades. It's a challenge for both experimentalists and theorists. I should mention that this is a problem now which is probably the most multidisciplinary problem in modern science. There are physicists, chemists, biologists, there are computer scientists, mathematicians, all working on this problem. There are mechanical engineers working on it because you can think of a necklace as, as a thing which is moving with respect to other parts of the chain uh, and how do these things move with respect to each other. So it's really the most multidisciplinary. It's probably the uh, problem which we tackle with the most number of different methodologies, experimental as well as theory. And it's also, as I discussed very briefly, it's a really important problem in modern biology for various species. So, in experiment, the problem is that it's a very fast process. This chain doesn't take its own sweet time to fold. It does it very, very rapidly. And because it does it rapidly, it becomes difficult to study. The other problem in theory, you have a chain, you know the chemistry of the chain. You know a lot now about different physical forces, hydrogen bonds, uh, Van der Waals interactions, electrostatic interactions, you know a lot about all this, but you don't know how they work together. And so theoretically it's a big problem to fold a protein. Uh, we know, you know, now in the, there's a database of proteins or the protein database, there are tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand structures in that of protein which have been solved by X-ray crystallography and NMR. So we know that a lot about the native or functional state of a protein. That it's like a solid, it's compact, it's well stabilized, it's formed from either seeds or beta sheets, etc. And so a lot is known. You know, when the first protein structure came out uh, around 1960 or so, people thought that we know the chemistry of the chain, we know the structure. So it should be trivial to find out what the relationship between sequence and structure is. But it's now nearly 50 years later and we are still far away from solving this uh, problem. One part of the problem is that the starting from our state unfolded, we are going to this, we know very little about this. It looks like it's liquid-like, it doesn't have any real structure, it, it's a chain which is just moving around uh, and so you don't know what is stabilizing it, you don't know whether there are structures, it may form a structure, they open up the structure. And really one doesn't know much about it at all. Uh, there are different types of uh, approaches which are being taken. One is phenomenological. And this is what bioinformatics is to you. Probably have all heard about the field of bioinformatics. Uh, bioinformatics is study all these hundred thousand structures which are there in the database and try to get some information of how the sequence of amino acids correlates with these final structures. Uh, so you classify, you look at this, you compare one protein structure to the other, etc. Uh, there are ab initio and computational methods which try to just calculate the energy because if the protein has folded, it must be the most stable structure. The folded structure must be the most stable structure. So can you energetically calculate computationally the most stable structure? And there are many problems in that. Part of the problem that you know very little about the unfolded state of the protein. And the other problem is that proteins are very marginally stable. You know, the, if you look at 
the actual, you have two states of the protein, unfolded and folded. Each of them have got very high energies. So this has got an energy of 100,000 and the native state has got an energy of 99, uh, of, uh, let's say it's got an energy of 1000 kilojoules and this has got an energy of 995 kilojoules. Okay, so the difference is 5 kilojoules. There are two large numbers and a very small difference. So if you want to computationally calculate the more stable, you, your computation, your calculation has to be accurate to more than 0.5 percent, 5 over 1000. And that is where there's a big problem. And the other big problem is that computers, even though they become faster and faster and faster, are still not fast enough to, to make a protein fold in the computer. So part of the problem is that we don't know, we know different types of forces are involved, bond stretching forces, bond bending forces, electrostatic interaction, hydrogen bonds, uh, Van der Waals bonds. But we don't know what the relative importance of all these interactions is. And that's where part of their problem is in defining energy functions to make the protein fold in the computer. The other problem for bioinformaticists is that you might think that if you have a sequence such as A, B, C, D, E, uh, in one, if it takes a particular conformation, for example, a helical conformation in this protein, it will do it in all protein. But that's not true at all. In this protein, for example, it's, for, it's in an extended conformation for the beta strand. So the same sequence, B, D, L, L, K, N, is in helical conformation here and in a strand conformation here. So there's no way to predict this thing. And the other thing is, these are proteins, hemoglobin, myoglobin, these are all important in oxygen transport in your uh, circulatory system. These proteins are very similar in the, in the uh, in structure, as you can see. But if you look at the sequence of amino acids, uh, it is, they're completely different. So even though things are completely different, they fold in the same way. And again, that adds to the complexity of the problem. And even that function is completely different, these two proteins are completely different. This is a protein which is involved in your cytoskeleton, in what gives shape to your cells. This is a protein which helps other proteins to fold. You can see the structure is somewhat similar, but they are completely different functions. So how does one rationalize all this? So by, we try to do it by studying the field of protein folding. So why is it important to study folding? If you want to deduce or predict the structure from any given sequence, you know, nowadays it's very easy to get to sequence whole genomes uh, get lots of sequence information, but you, what you need to find out is the structure of the proteins which is the genome code for, so that you know the functions which are involved. And if you don't know the protein coding code, you can't do that. If you want to order existing proteins, suppose you want to uh, engineer plant uh, a seed of a particular plant so that it has more of a particular amino acid. So many have seeds, uh, plants will not have, for example, tryptophan. You want to introduce that. Can you just put it anywhere in a seed protein or do you have to be doing specific parts? If you put it anywhere, the protein may not fold properly, so they won't function properly, and the plant will die, the seed will die. So you need the protein to be functional and you need to order things properly. If you want to make leather stronger, you want to make silk stronger, if you want to make any other protein stronger, you have to be able to understand this code of sequence, which is the sequence of beads or amino acids in your polymer chain and the final structure. Uh, if you want to understand the connection between function and structure of any protein, you need to understand this code. And what's also become important and which most of half my lab works on right now is that there are many diseases which, in which proteins do not fold properly. You know, you are all familiar with protein aggregates, at least those of you who eat eggs. Uh, if you boil an egg, you find that it becomes the protein has all come out and you have a nice solid mass. Okay. That is the boiled egg. What has happened there is that the protein has, which had the proper structure, the structure was broken by the heating and the protein aggregated. That means that just all the molecules stuck to each other and it came out the solution. So you have a boiled egg. So folding is like unboiling in it. Okay. 
And the question is, the problem is that in your body, this boiling of an egg, the equivalence of a boiling of an egg is happening all the time. There are proteins which are synthesized in your cells, there are too much of them, they will come together and stick to each other and aggregate up a solution. And that happens all the time in your body, your cellular machinery can deal with it. But there are some many cases where that doesn't happen. So you have all heard of Alzheimer's disease, which people when they age sometimes get, where protein deposits form inside your brain. That happens because the protein instead of folding correctly, it misfolds. Because it misfolds, many of the misfolded proteins come together, aggregate, and you have these insoluble clumps of protein inside your brain, and that kills the brain cells, and you get Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's disease is also such a disease. It's not the same protein uh, aggregating, but some other protein. Uh, all the prion diseases are diseases where a protein, the prion protein, will uh, uh, enter your brain and cause all other prion protein molecules to aggregate, and again you have this uh, brain tissue dying. So there is cystic fibrosis, is another disease. There are many diseases, most of them the names I cannot pronounce because they are rather complicated medical names. But uh, this has become very important now because in many, so many cases, a protein instead of folding properly is misfolding and forming aggregates. So, for example, in the prion protein, the aggregate, the normal structure is like this, but in the aggregate, it's supposed to become like this. We know very little of how this structural transition happens. How does it misfold like this? Is something which we are working on in our lab, and uh, quite a bit, and we are studying these type of aggregates. These aggregates look like little strings, which are a few nanometers in thickness and maybe a microns in length. Okay. So there are uh, very tiny strings if you look at the atomic post microscope. Uh, we can study aggregation of different types of aggregates which are formed. You can see they are very regular aggregates. They are not like amorphous clumps. And uh, they form with very well defined kinetics. And we try to understand how the protein is formed and form clumps. We look for differences in the structure of aggregates. Sometimes the same protein can form a fat aggregate or a thin aggregate because in one case it's a bilayer of beta sheets, in one other case it's a monolayer. So these are things which we are very interested in because these are the type of structures which are toxic to cells and break up the cells. So we work with many different proteins in my lab and uh, are trying to study how they fold, what is the mechanism of folding. So one thing I should tell you is that protein folding is happening all the time in your cell. Proteins are, it's not only when they synthesize that they fold. Even after synthesize, they are unfolding, folding, unfolding, folding all the time. And the classic example is what happens when you move any part of your body, when any muscle moves. Okay. So what happens in, when muscle movement, there are two proteins, actin and myosin, which slide along each other. Okay. And when you have contraction, they go this, this way, and when you have relaxation, they go this way. Now, if you have something moving like this, you don't want them to go like this. So how do you prevent it from going like this? The simple solution any one of you can think of is you put a rubber band. If you put a rubber band, if it, you stretch the rubber band too much, the rubber band will make it contract like this. So now you need a molecular scale rubber band in your muscle cells. What? What is the molecular scale rubber band? It's another protein. It's a protein called titan. So this protein called titan can expand and it can contract. How does it expand and contract? It can expand and contract because it's made out of little protein units like this. So it, can, it expands by these units unfolding so it becomes long. And then when it has to contract, these little units form again so it becomes small. So it becomes short long, short, long, but you can think of it as a string with lots of knots on it. So when it has to become long, the knots unfold, when it becomes short, the knots fold again. Okay. So it's something which is happening every time you move any little part of your body. Okay. So protein folding and unfolding is something which is happening all the time. So the question is also, when people first started thinking with the problem, they worried about something 
for the length half parallel. So if you have a protein with 100 different beads, 100 different amino acids, and you just assume that each amino acid can be in three different combinations, then there will be 3 raised to 100 possible combinations, or about 10 raised to 47 different combinations present. So if the protein has to fall by sampling every conformation, and even if you take that each sampling takes a picosecond, which is about the fastest it can be, then it will take 10 to 27 years for the protein to go. But proteins take a few seconds or milliseconds or microseconds to go. Okay? Remember the age of the universe is 10 by 10 and by 11 years or so. So how does this happen? And this has been a problem which has been driving people to think about folding for a very long time. And the idea is that you don't sample all of conformational space, you go in a directed manner to the native state. And the directedness is coming because the native state is more stable than all the other states which are present. So probably the most important work in protein folding, critical work in protein folding is the work of G.N. Ramchandran when he was in Chennai and later in Bangkok. Uh, this is really the most important theoretical method done when computers are not really there, when things like uh, calculators essentially had to be used. And uh, he showed that you can't, the chain cannot sample all confirmation, it's sampling only very restricted space. So if you are in a yield confirmation, if this is all a confirmation space, you can only select, you can only sample here. If you have a beta sheet, you can only sample here. If there is a left-handed index, you can sample only here. And this is probably even 50 years later up, since this work was first published, this is really the single most important study, which no one, even with the fastest computers, nowadays has been able to match. And I think uh, we should all be very proud of this. So if you look at protein structure, something complicated like this, the moment you see something complicated, you, you try to break it into simpler parts. So, if you see a complicated structure, you ask, is it built up from its parts? So, is this structure built up from this, and this built from this, and this built from this, and this? Is that how proteins fold? So, you can think of folding this part from first, and this form part first, they come together to give it this. This adds up some other part, and it becomes this, and then this becomes this. Is that how proteins fold? And that is something which uh, is a very attractive idea. And what I want to do is make an analogy to evolution. You know, over evolution, we have come up with extremely complicated parts of our body, our eyes, for example. Uh, how does these, how do these structures come? You know, in, in millions of years, and evolution has given you eyes. Similarly, evolution has given you very precise protein structure. And there was an experiment which was actually done. And the experiment was this, a typewriter was placed in front of a monkey. And the monkey was allowed to type randomly on the typewriter. And the goal was to see whether a particular sentence from a particular play, in this case a play by Shakespeare called uh, Hamlet, and there was a famous sentence there called Me Kids, it is like a piece of, uh, from that uh, play. Uh, how soon would the monkey be able to come up with the sentence? Now, so, so, um, so you would think that if you just put a monkey in front of a typewriter, it would never be able to come up with a sentence which made any sense. Okay? But if you do something very simple, that if you, every time it typed a letter correctly in a particular position in the sentence, you don't allow that to change. Okay? So for example, S is here. You type S out here, and you don't allow the monkey to change that. So even if it types that key again from, for that position, it doesn't, that S doesn't change. Then within 3,000 typing events, you get the correct sentence. Amazingly fast. What you're doing is, when in the, if I make the analogy to folding, 
you know, correct structure forms during folding. If you don't allow the structure to break up, then folding can happen very, very rapidly. Okay? So within 3,000 typing events, a monkey comes up with the sentence which makes sense, if you want it. Okay? Now if you put two monkeys, say for two typewriters, or you put the same monkey and make it do it several times, each time it will come up with a different sequence of correct letters which gives you the same final sentence. Okay? You can see the pattern of green here is different from the pattern of green here. Because so intuitively you will you will expect that. Okay? What what does this imply? It implies that maybe pro one protein molecule full form structure in one particular way, another protein molecule form structure in another particular way. They both go to the same end point, but the way they go to the end point is completely different. And the analogy which you can make is to assembling a jigsaw puzzle. So many of you or most of you or all of you have assembled a jigsaw puzzle at some point in your life. You all know that when you assemble a jigsaw puzzle, the end product is the complete jigsaw puzzle. There's only one complete. You can start with any piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Okay? Any part of the chain can form structure first. And you can assemble them in any different way. I've shown it for a very small jigsaw puzzle. But you can have multiple ways of doing it, as shown by all the arrows. Is this what happens really? Or is there only one way of doing it? Okay? That is still a very un important unanswered question in protein folding. And one way to think about it is this is your native conformation. This is your unfolded conformation in all different energy states. The protein, one protein molecule can hop from here to here to here to here and come like this to the native state. Another molecule can do it this way. A third molecule might go this way. This would mean there are many different ways of doing it. There are completely random ways of doing it. So is this what is really happening? This is something which, which is still not really answered. And more recently, over the past 20, 30 years, many, many physicists have started working on this problem. And there are models for free energy landscapes which imply that there are Folding is completely random. One molecule does it this way, another molecule does it this way. Uh, so in one molecule, the helix might form first, the other molecule, the sheet might form first, but they both go to the same native state. And there are these, what are called funnel energy landscapes for protein folding, where the native state is here, and all the unfolded conformations are on top. So it's like, if you're in the Himalayas, the valley is where you want to go to. But if you're skiing or you're walking down the uh, mountain range, one person can go this way, one person can walk this way, you'll all go back, go down to the same point. Okay? So that's what these pictures really try to depict. And a few years ago, my lab had provided the main, the first real evidence and support for these type of pictures. So what does this picture say? That when you're in the unfolded state, you're sampling everything. So you have a lot of entropy, conformational entropy. Entropy is a, is a measure of disorder. So the unfolded state, the chain is, is flopping around, there's a lot of disorder. The native state has got very little disorder, but it's the most stable. So what we showed by looking at populations of molecules is that as you go to more and more stabilizing conditions, the amount of disorder goes down and down and down, which is exactly what the funnel energy landscape show. Yeah. Now, part of the problem, you know, the, uh, what I want to do is give you some flavor of the type of questions which we are interested in and which people in the field are interested in. You are going from here to here. This is more stable, this is less stable. But are you just rolling down like this or do you have to cross a barrier to go over this? There are many ways you can think of a barrier. When one barrier is an entropy barrier. For those of you who know about thermodynamics and physics, entropy is disorder. And when you're folding a protein, the entropy is decreasing. So is there an entropic barrier? So the barrier which arises because there's a mismatch between entropy and enthalpy as a protein folds. We all know free energy is the difference between entropy and enthalpy. And if there's a mismatch, then you'll have a free energy barrier. You can't just roll down. You have to climb up and then roll down. Whereas, 
If instead of one mismatch, you have many, many small mismatches, then you have many, many small barriers, and then you can kind of roll over it. It's like if you have a rough inclined plane, a marble will still roll down, it rolls slowly, but it will roll down the rough inclined plane. Whereas if you have an inclined plane with a little hump, big hump on it, a marble will reach the hump and then go back and it won't go over the hump, unless it's coming down very fast to start up there. Okay? So is that, is this the picture which is correct for folding or is this the correct? In the language of, uh, of physicists, you think of, in one case, if there is uh, a barrier, you are either here or here and you have to hop over. Whereas if you are, so you have two population of molecules. This goes down and this goes up as folding up, uh, proceed. Whereas if it's rolling down, or uh, what's called downhill or gradual folding, then you have one population of molecules which go from one energy level in a continuous manner to the other energy level. Okay. So is that what is happening? And that's something which is in driving the work in my lab, this problem for many, many years. So there are many different methodologies one can use. Uh, optical methods, NMR methods, mass spec me methods, atomic force microscopy, single molecule methodologies. So physicists, chemists, biologists, mathematicians all have to be involved in this type of work. And we use many of the methods which are listed out here. I'm not sure many of you can't read this, but there are things like X-ray scattering, uh, NMR, real-time NMR, dynamic NMR, fluorescence methods, circular diacrylic methods, etc. Okay. But what guides one's thinking is how perhaps does this happen? Uh, how is conformational space restricted? So one way you can think about it is that we have a chain and when it starts folding it just suddenly collapses. If it suddenly collapses there is much less conformational space to sample and then folding can happen. So that's what's called the collapse model. We first have collapse and then secondary structure. The other way to consider is that you have this necklace which is flopping and some cubicle structure forms here and cubicle structure here and the necklace bends and these two things come together and that's what's in this model. So you first have secondary structure forming as shown as the pink region out here and then they come together and you have your protein structure forming. Or there is some form, or there could be a nucleation type event. One little part of the structure form and all the structure builds around it, just like in crystals, uh, crystals form in solution. A sodium chloride crystal or salt crystal. So we, uh, many years ago, had shown, provided the first evidence for collapse of the chain. It's called hydrophobic collapse because the idea is that all the oily parts of the chain, I told you there are 20 different amino acids, they have different chemistry. Some are charged, some are non-charged, some are oily, some are non-oily. So one idea is that the chain collapses because all the oily parts come together. You all know that if you put oil drops in water, the oil drops all come together and you have a bigger oil drop floating on water. Okay? Uh, so is that what happened? And we have provided the first evidence that you first have this collapse and then structure forms. And it's a it's a simple picture, it's an intuitive picture because water drives all the oily parts. So you can see these aromatic side chains uh, out here, benzene type side chain. These come together, these are the oily parts, and there's very little entropic cause because water is not thrown out yet uh, from the uh, protein. So is this what is really happening uh, when a protein folds? And there are two properties of protein which are very important. The interior, the protein is very compact. If you look at the, if you take a cross section to the middle of a protein, you find that all the oily parts are inside. And all the parts which like to interact with water are outside. There are some oily parts outside also, but most of the inside has all oily parts. Okay. Um, and so this is the surface and this is a cross section to the middle. And you can also see that there is really no space, empty space inside the protein. It's very well packed. It's about as well packed as you can pack anything. 80% of the space is occupied by atoms. There is no water inside at all. Water is only on the surface. So how does all this hydrophobic collapse happen? 
So one of the questions we have been interested in for a long time is the collapse, the process where you have to jump from an open extended confirmation to compact confirmation or we roll down a hill. So how does one answer these type of questions? So one way to know whether you are collapsing is if you can measure some distance along your necklace. Okay? So if, if this cable is my necklace, if I can measure this distance and find out in the, in the unfolded state the distance is so much, in the folded state the distance becomes so much. So how does one measure distance? There is a method called FRED, Fluorescence Resonance Energy Transfer, which is quite simple to do, which allows you to measure that. You put two fluorescent molecules on your chain, you excite this fellow and you measure the fluorescence of this. What happens is uh, there is transfer of energy from this guy to this guy because you've excited this guy. And the efficiency of transfer depends on how close they are. And it's a dipole-dipole interaction and goes at R is to minus 6 distance dependence. So you have a very strong distance dependence and by measuring this efficiency of energy transfer, you can get a very good measure of distance. So this intramolecular distance is a very good measure of how the reaction is proceeding because in the unfolded state the distance is large, in the folded molecule it is small. So how does this distance become this distance? Does it just go continuously like this or you're either here or here and this comes down and this goes up? Okay. Is it two state or gradual? So it's not an easy experiment to do. Uh, but the concept is simple. You can measure FRET uh, in many different ways, either by intensity measurements or by lifetime measurement. In fluorescence, you're making fluorescence measurement. In fluorescence, you have a ground state and an excited state. You measure how long you are in the excited state by measuring the lifetime. That's a nanosecond. And these measurements are not difficult to do. So, we met, for the same protein, we measure a dozen different distances in the protein molecule between this part and this part, this part and this part, this part and this part, this part and this part. Okay? And the idea was how do all these distances change as the protein folds? Do they all change in the same way or does this move independently of this, etc. Those are the type of questions we asked. And what we found is that the different distances change in completely different way. So from one point of the molecule we measure 12 different distances and they, they're not synchronized, they don't all change together. It's like different parts of the protein are behaving independently of each other. Okay? So you have a string, as you can imagine, if you take a string and let it flip-flop, the different parts of the string will not behave uh, in synchrony with uh, other parts of the chain. And that's exactly what happens when a protein chain is trying to fold. And the idea is that we have many pathways for folding. Some parts fold this way, some parts go this way. That's why different parts are behaving differently. And what we wanted to do then was measuring, measure how fast this process occurs. The initial part of the chain just collapses. We wanted to measure where the structure forms there, how fast it forms, which part forms first. And to do that, we had to build a uh, instrument which allowed us to measure rates as fast as 20, 25,000 per second. You don't get commercial instruments which allow you to do that. So we had to build this. And it works for very fast reactions. And what we are able to show, um, this is the data, I won't tell you, the data is not important right now. We are able to show that first you have a chain compaction happening very fast, with rates of 20,000 per second or so, and their structure forms with rates of about 5,000 per second. So within one millisecond, you have some collapse form with some structure. It's not the native state, there's a long way to go yet. But what's, for any process, you always have to know how the process begins where that dictates what happens next, and that's what we are trying to do out here. And we could show that what's happening in the first millisecond is not a hopping process from here to here, but is something happening like this. And that's based on the type of kinetic measurement which I won't uh, describe right now. So you have really, there are many arrows here to indicate that it's really a continuous process, something happening in less than 100 microseconds, then some structure forming in about 250 microseconds and then the rest of the protein protein property. So these are experiments which uh, we have done some years ago but then and also more recently to bring out different aspects of this problem. Um, so what I'm trying to do is, you know, some of these things you will 
my idea is to give you a flavor of the type of research. That's far more important for you to get than the actual detail. Details you can always write to me or you can read my papers or come and discuss with me or whatever. So I want to give you a flavor. So now the question is, you have an unfolded state, a native state, you might have a barrier or it might be continuous. But if you have a barrier, are there intermediate states? If the intermediate state is unstable, so it's showing higher in energy out here, then it's populated too little to be detected. If, you know, the amount, the free energy difference between this and this tells you how much this is populated. So if this is populated to less than 5%, you'll never be able to detect it experimentally. No method is good enough to detect things uh, really present to 1% one, one percent or 2% percent except for some very complicated NMR experiments. Okay? So in none of these cases will you detect an intermediate. You might have one intermediate, but it's two and you may not detect it. There might be many intermediates as shown out here and you may not detect it. If you have many, many intermediates, it's like having a continuous process, gradual process. Only where the intermediate is more stable than the unfolded as shown out here will it be present for you to see in enough amount for you to detect and then study. Okay. So some of the work we have done is, suppose you have this case, can you do something which will stabilize this with respect to this, so instead of having this energy profile, you have this energy profile. And we have been successful in doing that and then you get an idea of what is happening first. You know, you're not just going suddenly up, you're going to an intermediate to the transition state. So these are things which we are studying. So if you look at Reactions in protein folding and folding, they look very simple. You have exponential kinetics. Exponential kinetics are normally seen when A goes to B, for example, a two-state process. You have either A or B, either U or N, and you're hopping from there. So many people in the field think that, have thought that this is just a two-state reaction, protein folding or unfolding. But it really depends on what type of probes you use. And if you you know, you can take a protein in solution, you can add uh, acid to it, base to it. And if you do that, you find partly folded conformations like more what are called molten globule. And these have been studied for many years. We have been studying something called a dry molten globule uh, very recently and have shown for the first time this, such a species exists. This is a species which is like the native, except it's got water all inside it. The water has not all been thrown out, so it's not become compact. Okay. This is an expanded form of the native state. So you can imagine that this bottle is in this dimension has become bigger by about 5 10 percent. Okay, so when it unfolds, it will be a big bottle. But the beginning of the unfolding is when it just increases this dimension by 5 percent. That's what the, if it increases only by 5 percent, then water will not enter. That's a bad analogy because it's a water bottle, but you can imagine it's a bottle full of sand particles. Uh, so, you know, when a protein unfolds, does it first just expand a little, as shown out here, without the water going in, and then water goes in, and then it starts swelling. Any polymer, if you put in, a, in water, will swell. You know, on the roadside, you can see these guys selling these uh, polymers which they put in water, and suddenly, you know, over a period of time, very slowly it will expand and become very big. Is that what happens when a protein unfolds? And uh, so that's what we've been studying. And we could show both uh, aspects of the folding reaction. The first aspect, that the beginning part is a very small swelling where all the conformational entropy increases and allows the folding to begin. Uh, but later the swelling process happens. So we could show by using the spread based methods that here you have a protein where a helix is packed against a strand. And it's very well packed. And the only way a helix can move away from this, from the beta sheet is the packing is become weaker. And we could measure that packing become weaker by measuring the movement of the helix away from the sheet right at the beginning of the unfolding reaction. And this is the data which shows that. And this was really the first direct observation of a dry moving globule during unfolding. Uh, then we you know, very often you have to build very complicated 
uh, instrumentation to look at uh, what you want to look at. And this is a paper I'm especially happy about because it's the first paper from the Data Institute of Fundamental Research in which uh, I'm in the biology section, Krishnamurti, my collaborator is in the chemistry division, and Deepak Thar uh, is a physicist in the Data Institute. This is the first collaboration from EIFR, which has physics, chemistry, and biology in it. And Deepak Thar is probably one of the smartest theoretical physicists in the country uh, right now. It, will, it was very difficult to convince him that this was a problem worth working on. Um, but uh, his contribution was really immense. So we wanted to do measurements where we are looking at the distance distributions between these two points. You know, the point is not one distance, but there's a distribution of distances because there's still flexibility. Okay, there's heterogeneity in the structure. So we wanted to measure distances as they change during unfolding, so we had to do a complicated setup. You could measure these distances. These are four different distances which we measure. And the distances change in different ways. And you could show that the molecule is swelling by diffusive motion. We used a very simple way uh, suggested by Deepak uh, to analyze the data where we use a simple idea in polymer physics of uh, how a polymer chain behaves as it, uh, as it undergoes uh, free flight motion. Uh, and uh, the, the colored lines are the data and the black lines are the fits to the model. And you can see to a zero approximation it's very good. So, for unfolding, we could tell that you don't just have a barrier like this, but you're going to many, many small barriers. These are the distribution of molecules as they go from one state to another to another during unfolding. Uh, so we've been looking at other proteins also. So we, I said that the first part is just expansion without watering it. But it's very difficult to imagine that water doesn't enter any part of the protein molecule. So we wanted to see where does it enter first, where does it enter last, uh, when does the inside, the deep inside of the protein, which is most rigid, well packed part, when does that become mobile? And there are physical methods of doing that, for example, an isotropy measurement. If you have a ring, uh, a fluorescent uh, amino acid in the middle of your protein, it can lose its directional uh, uh, isotropic properties. Uh, the fluorescence uh, anisotropy can get lost uh, by the tumbling of that inside. The native protein is rigid, so it will not lose its uh, uh, anisotropy. But when it unfolds, it starts losing its anisotropy. And we measured how that happens during unfolding. And uh, again, this is the data and support. But the idea is what we showed was the native state gradually unfolded, no water enters. Then finally, water enters into the core in what's called a wet molten globule. And at the same time, the tryptophan the interior of the plant uh, or the protein starts moving around. And then you have a fully unfolded chain. Uh, and this is something we have shown in a different way uh, many years ago. So these are the type of measurements which one does. I will very quickly uh, take just another three, four minutes to give you again flavor of a completely different way of looking at uh, methodology of looking at unfolding. So this is another protein which is involved in a protein which is part of a domain of a protein signal transduction protein which is involved in cancer for example. And uh, we were asking questions of uh, the rate limiting step in the unfolding process etc. And we could show that a wet molten globule is formed after the rate limiting, this is the rate limiting step because this is the biggest barrier to folding. We could show that this is still a wet molten globule and then there's a dry molten globule out here. And we did this by doing some tricks which I won't talk about. One of the very interesting things one saw was this. So suppose you have a protein with a structure like this. This is the unfolding, just sequential. So for example, this and this part unfolds, this part unfolds, this part unfolds, and then you have this. Okay? Or can it be that this part goes in and then comes back out and then it unfolds? You know, these are very important questions from the chemistry and physics viewpoint. If it goes in and comes out, it means it's a structure which is not present in your starting state. And what stabilizes it? Why does it do this? Those are the type of questions we are interested in. And we could show that this actually happened. 
that tip goes in and then comes out. There's a, a fluorescent part of the protein goes in, comes out, and then the protein unfolds. And this is something which has uh, really excited us, and we're trying to understand why this is happening by doing computer simulations. And this is the data we suppose that. The other important point about proteins I want to bring out is that if you look at a protein structure, it looks like something which is very rigid. But the protein is actually fluctuating on all types of time scales, different parts of it. Okay, it's like the, I'm not standing, like if I'm a protein, I'm not rigid like this. This part might be moving, this part might be moving, this part will be My leg might get cut off, my hand might get cut off, and then rejoin, etc. Okay, so that's what's happening to a protein all the time. It doesn't get cut off, but it may go like this and come back like this, or whatever. Okay. So, and that happens on all types of time scales, from picoseconds, nanoseconds, microseconds, seconds, tens of seconds, all the motions are happening all the time. How does one capture the motion? And are these motions important in the folding process itself? So, the other question is, how do things like pH or urea or guanidine unfold protein? These are chemicals you add to the protein and the protein unfold. How does heat unfold the protein? You know, I told you, you, you boil an egg, you're heating the egg in boiling water and the protein unfolds and then it becomes sticky and uh, forms your boiled egg. So, how do these things work? So, one of the things which we uh, use is a what's called hydrogen diffusion exchange. I'll very quickly go to this because it's a methodology which I'm very fond of. And so suppose you take a protein and you deuterate it everywhere. Okay. Uh, that's very simple to do. You can take a protein and unfold it in D2O and all the sites which can get deuterated will have D instead of A. Deuterium is the isotope of hydrogen. Okay. So it's heavy water. And if if, I, if this is my protein then the deuterium will not go inside. Okay? But if my protein unfolds a little, then the deuterium will attach itself here, but it won't go into this part. Okay? And deuterium has a mass of one atomic unit more than hydrogen. So if I measure, if I deuterate and measure the mass of this versus the mass of this, this will have a higher mass than this, because this has got more deuterated than this. Okay? And if, what I would like to know is which part has opened out, which part is the thumb. So what I would want to do is cut off my thumb so I know that it's the thumb, okay, which has got deuterated. So how does one do that? So there are methods of doing that, but you can easily tell that this and this have different masses by modern mass spectrometry. Okay, that's very trivial to do. What you can do also is, you allow this to get deuterated, this has more mass than this, then you cut this off by using an enzyme, like what I talked to you about, an enzyme that breaks up other proteins. You chew this up, so this part gets separate. I can, by modern what I call proteomics methods, I can identify this as the thumb, so I know that this part of the protein has unfolded first. And then this part, and then this part, and then this part. So those experiments are possible because of modern mass spectrometry. So for example, here, the native, we are starting with deuterated, the native state has a bigger mass than the uh, uh, unfolded because if you put this in water, every, all the deuterium gets replaced by hydrogen, so the mass is different, so the mass distribution is different. If there's a part which is like a thumb come out, then this has a mass in between the N and the U. And you can ask how does N go from I to U? And to I to you. So the, you know, so how do you go from here to here to here? Okay, just by measuring the mass after doing the deuterium hydrogen exchange. And these type of experiments give you very uh, informative data about how unfolding unfolding happens. I don't have the time to discuss it in detail, but we could tell that the thumb moving out is not either here or here. But it does it slowly like this. And then this opens one shot. Okay, it's like you allow this to come out and you kind of unlock something so then it can suddenly open. That's what this data tells you. I don't have the time to discuss it in detail, 
But as I said, my idea is to give you a flavor of, of the ideas in the field and how one tackles these ideas. And so these are the type of experiments which allow us to get structural information with very fast time resolution for folding and unfolding. You can ask questions of whether things are jumping from here to here, whether they're happening gradually. You can ask questions of which part of the chain is forming first and which part is forming later and which part is forming next. These are questions which are now become possible to answer by modern methodology. Uh, so for example, for this protein, you could show that this is the part which unfolds first, the red part, a little later, there's more unfolding, and finally the yellow part also unfolds. So you can, these are not difficult, uh, particularly difficult experiments to do. So I'd like to end by, uh, this is my group. I've talked about the work of really uh, just a couple of the students. Many of the students work on things which are, uh, which are not talked about. Uh, I already talked work on protein aggregation of how these proteins such as uh, synuclein cause Parkinson's or tau causes Alzheimer's or the prion protein causes prion diseases. Uh, those are things hopefully you will invite me again to talk at some later time. But uh, uh, you know, this is the problem I started off as an independent researcher, the problem of how proteins fold to their normal function. It's of course important to study how they misfold also. Okay. Uh, sometimes misfolding is actually very important. You know, or the color of your skin is because of a pigment or melanin. Uh, and that pigment has to be deposited in your skin cells. And obviously it has to be deposited in a very uniform manner. Okay, so you need some scaffold for, the, for your pigment to be put in your skin cells. That scaffold is caused by the same type of aggregates which cause Alzheimer's disease. It's aggregates formed by uh, another protein, but it's the same principle and the same structures which are allowing your pigment to be uniformly distributed in your skin cell uh, which are causing Alzheimer's disease if you're unlucky to get it. Okay. There are many the way, you know, bacteria, you must have heard of what I call biofilm. Bacteria sticking to ships in the ocean or to various surfaces. They all do because of these uh, protein aggregates which are very sticky and bring things together. So sometimes, uh, you know, evolution has allowed these things to have function, these aggregates to have function, sometimes they cause disease. But the common, any protein will form these aggregates, sometimes for proper physiological function, sometimes they cause disease, and those are the type of things uh, we are interested in. So I thank you for your attention. If you have questions,